My name is William Michael. I'm the headmaster of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. And in this lesson, we're going to begin our study of the Summa Theologica by St. Thomas Aquinas. As you can see at the top of the page, uh, each lesson is going to consider one question from the Summa Theologica. And these questions themselves contain a number of different articles or individual points of inquiry which need to be studied. Unfortunately, in this first lesson, there are 10 points of inquiry or 10 articles within question one. So this is an unusually long lesson. Uh, it's going to take some time to get through. In this video, I'm going to walk you through your first reading of this lesson. But normally, lessons are not going to be this long. So I ask you to be patient as we work through this first lesson and to be hopeful that future lessons will be much easier and uh, require less time for our tutorial videos and our first reading. So before we get started, just a very brief note about our study of the Summa Theologica. Um, in the Summa, every article includes a question that's investigated by St. Thomas, objections, which are uh, responses to that question, which are not in line with Catholic faith, and then replies to those objections by St. Thomas. In addition to these, St. Thomas answers the question himself positively. And so we've got a bunch of different parts for each article within a question. In this course, because this is simply a, a, an entry-level study of the Summa Theologica, our concern is going to be to learn the answers taught by St. Thomas to each question in each article. We're not going to concern ourselves with the objections or with his replies to the objections. And there's a, a couple of reasons for that. First of all, um, many of the uh, objections that are listed by St. Thomas Aquinas uh, are not issues today. We're not going to face these issues. Um, and so learning all of the, the refutations of these objections would not be a good use of our time in our first reading of the Summa. Secondly, um, the, the objections and issues that do exist in our time are often new. And we need to learn and focus on St. Thomas's method, uh, which is more important for us than his actual replies to the objections that he encountered and answered in his day. One of the things that the comprehension questions for each lesson are going to ask of you is to identify the universals that St. Thomas reasons from in his demonstrations of his answers. By universals, we mean general princium, principles, axioms, uh, definitions, and so on, uh, as well as authoritative sources that he reasons from. Because, as I said, we want to learn his method so that we can apply his method to new questions in our own generation. So uh, this lesson is, is a lengthy one, so I don't want to take up too much time with introduction. I just wanted to, to get that um, clear up front that we're not going to study the objections or St. Thomas's replies to the objections. We're simply going to read the question for each article and then seek to know and understand St. Thomas's answer to that question. So let's go ahead and get started with this first question. Um, up at the top of the page, you can see question one, and the subject is the nature and extent of sacred doctrine. Let's go ahead and begin here. Under the lesson, we'll start with St. Thomas's introduction to this first question. He says, to place our purpose within proper limits, we first endeavor to investigate the nature and extent of sacred doctrine. And concerning this, there are 10 points of inquiry which will be seen in each of the articles below. The 10 points of inquiry that St. Thomas says must be investigated for us to address 
the question of the nature and extent of sacred doctrine are these. First, whether sacred doctrine is necessary. Second, whether sacred doctrine is a science. Third, whether sacred doctrine is one or many sciences. Fourth, whether sacred doctrine is a speculative or a practical science. Fifth, how sacred doctrine is compared with other sciences. Sixth, whether sacred doctrine is the same as wisdom. Seventh, whether God is the subject matter of sacred doctrine. Eighth, whether sacred doctrine is a matter of argument. Ninth, whether sacred doctrine rightly employs metaphors and similes. And lastly, tenth, whether the sacred scripture of this doctrine may be expounded in different senses. So ten points of inquiry that are going to be investigated as we study the nature and extent of sacred doctrine. So let's just move right on. This is to be considered your first reading of this lesson. And if you look up here at step number two in the task list, you'll see study the lesson for mastery. The first step of studying the lesson for mastery is simply to read through the full content of the lesson. And I'm going to help you do that in this tutorial video. So let's go ahead and study article number one, whether, besides philosophy, any further doctrine is required. Whether, besides philosophy, any further doctrine is required for the life and happiness of man. To begin, St. Thomas quotes St. Paul's writing in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where he says, All scripture inspired of God, is profitable to teach, to reprove, to correct, to instruct in justice. Now, Scripture, inspired of God, is no part of philosophical science, which has been built up by human reason. Therefore, it is useful that besides philosophical science, there should be other knowledge, namely, knowledge inspired by God. So the answer to this question we can see, whether besides philosophy any further doctrine is, re is required, we can already see that St. Thomas's answer is yes. Besides philosophy, some other doctrine is required, doctrine which is inspired by God. Now let's read St. Thomas's answer. You see, it begins with, I answer. I answer, says St. Thomas, that it was necessary for man's salvation that there should be a knowledge revealed by God besides philosophical science built up by human reason. Note that he says it was necessary for man's salvation. This is what makes this sacred doctrine necessary, that man's end goes beyond anything in this life. Man's salvation made it necessary that there should be a knowledge that was revealed by God besides philosophical science, which had been and would continue to be built up by human reason. And we want to understand why? What are the reasons uh, that St. Thomas gives for this answer? Firstly, because man is directed to God, not to anything in this world. Man is directed to God as to an end that surpasses the grasp of his reason. So man's end which is God himself, is greater than anything that man can investigate by means of reason alone. And then St. Thomas quotes 
uh, a passage from the prophet Isaiah. The eye hath not seen, O God, besides thee, what things thou hast prepared for them that wait for thee. In other words, man is ignorant of the knowledge of God. But the end must first be known by men who are to direct their thoughts and actions to the end. Hence, it was necessary for the salvation of man that certain truths which exceed human reason should be made known to man by divine revelation. Note that truths which exceed human reason should be made known by divine revelation. Notice that it doesn't say truths that are within the reach of human reason should be made known. That's very important. Truths which exceed human reason should be made known to man by divine revelation. Even as regards those truths about God, which human reason could have discovered, it was necessary that man should be taught by a divine revelation because the truth about God, such as reason could discover by means of philosophy, would only be known by a few, that is, by the philosophers themselves. And that, after a long time, by years and years of meditation, experience, and study, and with the admixture of many errors. Now, this is not saying that philosophy is false. It's just saying that as philosophers work to investigate and discover the truth and build up philosophical science, it always has some error mixed in as the investigation still has more work to do and isn't finished, isn't perfect. So because it would always be mixed with error, it would require an, a great amount of time, and it would know, be known only by a few men in the world. Whereas man's salvation, which is in God, depends on the knowledge of this truth. Therefore, in order that the salvation of men might be brought about more fitly and more surely, it was necessary that men should be taught divine truths by divine revelation. It was therefore necessary that besides philosophical science built up by human reason, there should be a sacred science learned through revelation. So here we have a very clear distinction between philosophy and sacred doctrine, which we're going to call theology. There's a difference. Philosophy is science or systematic knowledge that's gained through the exercise of human reason. It's knowledge that's within human reach. But theology is knowledge that exceeds human reason or simply cannot be pursued by means of human reason because it, it requires too much time and would be limited to too few people and therefore God overrides the challenge of this investigation and simply delivers to men the truth by means of divine revelation. So the answer to the question in Article 1, whether besides philosophy any further doctrine is required, the answer is yes. Besides philosophy, some other doctrine is required, namely a sacred science learned through revelation. That's St. Thomas's answer to the first article. On to Article 2. Whether sacred doctrine is, in fact, a science. Whether sacred doctrine is a science. St. Thomas begins with a quote from St. Augustine, where he says, To this science alone belongs that whereby saving faith is begotten, nourished, protected, and strengthened. 
what St. Thomas argues is that this can be said of no science except sacred doctrine. Therefore, sacred doctrine is a science. He goes on to say, I answer that sacred doctrine is a science. And there, very simply put, is the answer to the question raised in this article, whether sacred doctrine is a science. St. Thomas says, yes, sacred doctrine is a science. He then clarifies his answer. We must bear in mind that there are two kinds of sciences. There are some which proceed from a principle known by the natural light of intelligence. There are some sciences which proceed from a principle known by the natural light of intelligence, that is, they're self-evident, such as arithmetic and geometry and the like. There are some, some sciences, which proceed from principles known by the light of a higher science. Thus, the science of perspective proceeds from principles established by geometry. Music proceeds from principles established by arithmetic. So there are two different kinds of sciences. One science is derived from self-evident truths that require no other learning, but other sciences are derived from principles of sciences that go before them and are prior to them. So it is that sacred doctrine is a science because it proceeds from principles established by the light of a higher science, namely the science of God and the blessed. Hence, just as the musician accepts on authority the principles taught him by the mathematician, so sacred doctrine or sacred science is established on principles revealed by God. So sacred doctrine is a science. There are two kinds of sciences. Sacred doctrine is not a science according to the first class of sciences, but sacred doctrine is a science according to the second class of sciences. Article number three, whether sacred doctrine is one science, whether sacred doctrine is one science. St. Thomas quotes sacred scripture and says, Holy Scripture speaks of sacred doctrine as one science. And he says, wisdom gave him the knowledge, scientiam, of holy things. So Holy Scripture speaks of this wisdom in the singular, speaks of it as one science, scientiam which is a singular noun. St. Thomas says, sacred doctrine is one science. And there is our answer to the question in Article 3, whether sacred doctrine is one science. St. Thomas says, sacred doctrine is one science. He then explains, the unity of a faculty or habit is to be gauged by its object not indeed in its material aspect, but as regards the precise formality under which it is an object. For example, man, ass, stone, agree in the one precise formality of being colored. And color is the formal object of sight. Therefore, because sacred scripture considers things precisely under the formality of being divinely revealed. Whatever has been divinely revealed possesses the one precise formality of the object 
of this science and therefore included under one under sacred doctrine as under one science so because the object of sacred doctrine is one therefore sacred doctrine is one science that's the answer to the question of article 3 moving on to article 4 whether sacred doctrine is a practical science whether sacred doctrine is a practical science or a speculative science. St. Thomas says, every practical science is concerned with human operations or actions. Moral science is concerned with human acts. Architecture is concerned with buildings. But sacred doctrine is chiefly concerned with God whose handiwork is especially man. Therefore, here's our answer. Sacred doctrine is not a practical science, but a speculative science. Sacred doctrine is not a practical science, but a speculative science. Why? Because every practical science is concerned with human operations, but sacred doctrine is not primarily concerned with human actions or operations. St. Thomas says, sacred doctrine being one extends to things which belong to different philosophical sciences because it considers in each the same formal aspect, namely, so far as they can be known through divine revelation. So because sacred doctrine is primarily concerned with anything that is known through divine revelation, it can interfere with or it can intersect with other philosophical sciences, but it is only one science because it's not primarily interested in those details. It's primarily interested in its one object, which is God and divine revelation. Hence, although among the philosophical sciences, one is speculative and another is practical, nevertheless, sacred doctrine includes both speculative and practical sciences. As God, by one and the same science, knows both himself and his works. Still, it is speculative rather than practical, because it is more concerned with divine things than with human acts. Though it does not treat even of these latter, though, I'm sorry, though it does treat even of these latter, inasmuch as man is ordained by them to the perfect knowledge of God, in which consists eternal bliss. So sacred doctrine is a speculative science, not a practical science. That's our answer to Article 4. Article 5, whether sacred doctrine is nobler or better than other sciences, whether sacred doctrine is nobler than other sciences. St. Thomas quotes Proverbs chapter 9, and says, other sciences are called handmaidens of sacred doctrine. Wisdom sent her maids to invite to the tower. So here, St. Thomas gives us an example of a spiritual interpretation of sacred scripture. Um, but he uses this to prove that other sciences are called the handmaidens of sacred doctrine, which makes it appear that sacred doctrine is nobler than other sciences. Let's read St. Thomas's answer. <clears throat> he writes, I answer that since this science is partly speculative and partly practical, it transcends all others, speculative and practical. One speculative science is said to be nobler than another, 
And here he gives the, the qualifications for one science to be said to be nobler than another. And he's going to use this uh, to prove that sacred doctrine is in fact the most noble. One speculative science is said to be nobler than another, either by reason of its greater certitude or the, the certainty with which its teaching can be known and proven, or by reason of the higher worth of its subject matter. So there are two ways uh, by which one science is said to be nobler or superior to another. One is by the greater certitude that it offers. The other is by the greater worth of its subject matter. It deals with more important subject matter or content. In both these respects, this science of sacred doctrine surpasses other speculative sciences. In point of greater certitude, because other sciences derive their certitude from the natural light of human reason, which can err. Whereas this sacred doctrine derives its certitude from the light of divine knowledge, which cannot be misled. So it is more certain than any other science or philosophy. In point of the higher worth of its subject, that because this science treats chiefly of those things which by their sublimity transcend human reason, while other sciences consider only those things which are within reason's grasp. So for both, based on both reasons, sacred doctrine is nobler than any other science. First, because it offers greater certitude being received by faith uh, trusting in the authority of God, and secondly, because it treats of higher or more noble subject matter, namely God himself. Of practical sciences, that one is nobler which is ordained to a further purpose or higher end, as political science is nobler than military science because the good of the army is directed to the good of the state. But the purpose of this science, insofar as it is practical, is eternal bliss or eternal happiness, to which, as to an ultimate end, the purposes of every practical science are directed. Hence, it is clear that from every standpoint, sacred doctrine is nobler than the other sciences. And there we have our answer to the question of Article 5, whether sacred doctrine is nobler than other sciences. The answer is yes. And you should know the two reasons why we can say that sacred doctrine is nobler than other sciences. As far as it's a speculative science, you should also know the reason why we can say sacred doctrine is nobler than other sciences, even when we consider it as a practical science. Next, Article 6. Whether this doctrine, whether sacred doctrine, is the same as wisdom, whether sacred doctrine is the same as wisdom. Very interesting question. St. Thomas quotes the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, and verse 6. This is your wisdom and understanding. And he's speaking of divine revelation. He's speaking of his law, which he gave to Israel through Moses. He's saying, this divine revelation is your wisdom. And this seems to suggest that the answer to the question in Article 6 is yes, this doctrine, this sacred doctrine, is the same as wisdom. Let's look at St. Thomas's answer. I answer that this doctrine is wisdom above all human wisdom, <clears throat> not merely in any one order, 
but absolutely. For since it is the part of a wise man to arrange and to judge, and since lesser matters should be judged in the light of some higher principle, he is said to be wise in any one order or area of, of uh, knowledge or activity who considers the highest principle in that order. Just back up and read that again real quick. It is the part of a wise man to arrange and to judge. And since lesser matters should be judged in the light of some higher principle, he is said to be wise in any one order who considers the highest principle in that order. Thus, in the order of building, he who plans the form of the house is called wise and architect, in opposition to the inferior laborers who trim the wood and make ready the stones. St. Paul said, as a wise architect, I have laid the foundation. Again, in the order of all human life, the prudent man, the prudent man is called wise inasmuch as he directs his acts to a fitting end. Wisdom is prudence to a man. Therefore, he who considers absolutely the highest cause of the whole universe, namely God, is most of all called wise. Hence, wisdom is said to be the knowledge of divine things, as Augustine says. But sacred doctrine essentially treats of God viewed as the highest cause, not only so far as he can be known through creatures, just as philosophers knew him. That which is known of God is manifest in them, says St. Paul in Romans 1 but also as far as he is known to himself alone and revealed to others. Hence, sacred doctrine is especially called wisdom. So the answer to our question in Article 6, whether this doctrine is the same as wisdom, the answer is yes. Sacred doctrine is the same as wisdom. On to question seven, whether God is the object of this science, whether God is the object of this science. St. Thomas says, the object of the science is that of which it principally treats. In this science, the treatment is mainly about God, for it is called philo uh, theology, sorry. It is called theology, treating of God. The Greek word theos means God. And here you see theology. Theology means the study or science of God. Therefore, and here's our answer, God is the object of this science. That's the answer to the question in Article 7. St. Thomas explains, I answer that God is the object of this science. The relation between a science and its object is the same as that between a habit or faculty and its object. Now, properly speaking, the object of a faculty or habit is the thing under the aspect of which all things are referred to that faculty or habit as man and stone are referred to the faculty of sight in that they are both colored. Hence, colored things are the proper objects of sight. But in sacred science, all things are treated under the aspect of God, either because they are God himself or because they refer to God as their beginning and end. Hence it follows that God is in very truth the object of this science. 
This is clear also from the principles of this science, namely the articles of faith. And by the articles of faith, St. Thomas refers to the points of faith that we profess to believe when we say the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed at Mass. This is clear from the principles of the science of sacred doctrine, namely the articles of faith. For faith is about God. Think, we, we recite the Apostles' Creed and we say, I believe in God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. The, the articles of faith are primarily concerned with God himself. The object of the principles and of the whole science must be the same, since the whole science is contained virtually in its principles. Some, however, looking to what is treated of in this science and not to the aspect under which it is treated, have asserted the object of this science to be something other than God, that is, either things and signs, or the work of salvation, or the whole Christ, as head and members. Of all these things, in truth, we treat in this science, but so far as they have reference to God. Whether God is the object of this science, the answer is yes. God is the object of sacred doctrine. Article number eight, whether sacred doctrine is a matter of argument whether sacred doctrine is a matter of argument. In other words, can we prove the articles of faith? Can we prove all of the points of sacred doctrine? Is sacred doctrine a matter of argument? St. Thomas quotes uh, St. Paul's letter to Titus and says, the scripture says that a bishop should, quote, Embrace the faithful word, which is according to doctrine, that he may be able to exhort in sound doctrine and to convince the gainsayers. So here we have a hint as to what the answer to this question might be. St. Paul suggests that a bishop is to work to convince the gainsayers or to convince the opponents of the faith. And that suggests that because they may be convinced of the faith, that sacred doctrine may be a matter of argument. Let's see what St. Thomas has to say. As other sciences do not argue in proof of their principles, but argue from their principles to demonstrate other truths in these sciences, so this doctrine does not argue in proof of its own principles which are the articles of faith, but from them it goes on to prove something else, as the apostle from the resurrection of Christ argues in proof of the general resurrection. However, it is to be borne in mind in regard to the philosophical sciences that the inferior sciences neither prove their principles nor dispute with any who deny them. But they leave this to a higher science, whereas the highest of them, namely metaphysics, can dispute with one who denies its principles, if only the opponent will make some concession. But if he concede nothing, it can have no dispute with him, though it can answer his objections. Hence, sacred scripture, since it has no science above itself, can dispute with one who denies its principles only if he admits some at least of the truths obtained through divine revelation. Thus, we can argue with heretics from text in Holy Writ or Holy Scripture and against those who deny one article of faith, we can argue from another. If our opponent believes nothing of divine revelation, there is no longer any means of proving the articles of faith by reasoning. 
If our opponent, that's a very important line, if our opponent believes nothing of divine revelation, doesn't believe in divine revelation, then there is no longer any means of providing the articles of faith or proving the articles of faith by reasoning, but only by answering his objections, if he has any, against faith. Since faith rests upon infallible truth, and since the contrary of a truth can never be demonstrated, it is clear that the arguments brought against faith cannot be demonstrations, but are difficulties that can be answered. So whether sacred doctrine is a matter of argument, we have a, a difficult answer. Um, St. Thomas seems to say yes and no. He says it's conditional based on what the other person already believes. If they're willing to grant the truth of the scriptures, for example, it's very easy to prove a false position or a true position based on the use of sacred scripture. But if, if someone will not grant us any common ground, they do not believe in the authorities and, and men who spoke in the past who had great reputation. They don't accept that. Uh, they don't accept the testimony of sacred scripture. Uh, they, don't they don't accept the testimony of the hierarchy of the church. If they will not grant any of the principles from which sacred doctrine proceeds, then sacred doctrine is not a matter of argument. But generally speaking, sacred doctrine is a matter of argument. And that's the answer to the question in article number eight. Next, article nine, whether Holy Scripture should use metaphors. Um, St. Thomas quotes, Osea or Hosea, the prophet, who says, I have multiplied visions. I have used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. To put forward anything by means of similitudes is to use metaphors. Therefore, sacred science may use metaphors. He writes, it is befitting to holy writ to put forward divine and spiritual truths by means of comparisons with material things. So when we talk about metaphors in divine revelation, we're talking about comparisons that God makes with natural things in order to communicate with us. God provides for everything according to the capacity of its nature. It is natural to man to attain to intellectual truths through sensible objects, because all our knowledge originates from sense. Hence, in holy writ, spiritual truths are fittingly taught under the likeness of material things. This is what Dionysius says, quote, We cannot be enlightened by the divine rays unless they be hidden within the covering of many sacred veils. It is also befitting holy writ, which is proposed to all without distinction of persons, to the wise and to the unwise I utter. To the wise and to the unwise, I am a debtor. That spiritual truths be expounded by means of figures taken from corporeal things, in order that thereby even the simple, who are unable by themselves to grasp intellectual things, may be able to understand it. So remember that one of the purposes of, of divine revelation is to communicate profound, mysterious truths about God to common people. And the principal way that God does this is by the use of similitudes and metaphors, parables, and so on. We see this clearly in the life of Jesus. 
So the answer to the question in Article 9, whether Holy Scripture should use metaphors, the answer is yes. Holy Scripture should use metaphors because what is being communicated exceeds human understanding. And therefore, there must be a way to communicate it. And we can communicate it by means of comparing it to things that God created in the world, which reveal this truth to us. Lastly, article number 10, whether in sacred scripture a word may have several different senses. Whether in sacred scripture a word may have several senses. This is a very important article here because this teaches us how to read and understand sacred scripture. So let's pay attention. St. Gregory says, Holy Scripture or Holy Writ, by the manner of its speech, transcends every science, because in one and the same sentence, while it describes a fact, it reveals a mystery. So it does appear based on this quote, that in Holy Scripture, a word may have several senses. Let's read St. Thomas's answer and proof. I answer, says St. Thomas, that the author of Holy Writ is God. The author of Holy Writ is God, in whose power it is to signify his meaning, not by words only, as man also can do, but by the things themselves. That is, God not only reveals himself by words, but he also reveals himself by the created things in the world, all of the things that he has made. He can signify his meaning, not by words only, but also by things themselves. So whereas in every other science things are signified by words, this science has the property that the things signified by the words have themselves also a signification. Therefore, the first signification, whereby words signify things, belongs to the first sense, which we call the historical or literal sense. The signification whereby things signify, I'm sorry, the signification whereby things signified by words have themselves also a signification is called the spiritual sense of sacred scripture, which is based on the literal and presupposes it. Now, this spiritual sense has a threefold division. For as the, as the Apostle says, the old law is a figure of the new law. And Dionysius says, the new law itself is a figure of future glory. Notice that both of them referred to the scriptures as a figure, something that foreshadows or points to something else. Again, the new law, whatever our head has done, is a type of what we ought to do. Therefore, so far as the things of the old law signify the things of the new law, there is this allegorical sense, allegorical sense. So far as the things done in Christ, or so far as things which signify Christ are types of what we ought to do, there is also the moral sense. But so far as they signify what relates to eternal glory, there is the anagogical sense. Since the literal sense is that which the author intends, and since the author of Holy Scripture is God, who by one act comprehends all things by his intellect, it is not unfitting, as Augustine says, if even according to the literal sense one word in Holy Scripture should have several senses. <laughs>
So the answer to the question whether in Holy Scripture a word may have several senses, the answer is yes. That brings us to the end of the 10th article, the final article of the first question on the nature and extent of sacred doctrine. We've read now the answers to all 10 of these controversial questions. You need now to begin studying this lesson for mastery so that you can complete your lesson assessment. I hope that this has been a helpful overview for lesson one of the Summa Theologica. If you need any additional help, you can contact us anytime on the Academy website. We're happy to help you. Good luck with your studies. Work hard to master the study of the Summa Theologica because the benefits of this study will be infinite, amazingly enriching your life as a Christian in the world. God bless your studies.